This is like free coaching right here. <laughs> it's really about mindset. It's like I can give you the steps. Yes, this exists. Let's celebrate it and let's find common ground. These are the different ways you can price your artwork. So this is very theoretical. Yeah, I'm worth this much! But then they're like, I'm worth this much, you know? Even the seasoned artists, they don't collect their data. So if you know something sells, sell some more. My role is to make the artist win. State your price and shut up. Hi everyone, this is Late Night Connections, where we're all about celebrating the power of creatives and change makers. I'm your guest host, Saul. Let's get right into it. Today we are joined by Malor Mokhtar. Malor Mokhtar is an artist coach with over a decade of experience in the art business world in New York City. Malor extends her passion for art beyond the classroom. As a coach, she guides artists to the intricacies of every aspect of developing their creative business. Malor's unique journey, shaped by her upbringing in different countries, infuses her art with a global perspective. Recognizing the gap between artistic education and business acumen, she actively works to bridge this divide. All right, welcome to the show, Malor. Thank you, I'm so happy to be here, So, Thank you for coming in so <laughs> late because this is Late Night Connections. Uh, well, before we get started, let's explain a little bit for our audience who may be visually impaired, who may not be able to see us right now. So I'll start first, I'll describe what I'm wearing, roughly how I look. I have recently dyed dark hair. I am wearing a black shirt dress and I have rainbow flower jewelry with a decent amount of piercings. And tats. Oh, oh, right, yeah. <laughs> I have tattoos. Bam, yes. Uh, I am wearing a Batek pattern top, a black tank top, black pants, and gold earrings. And uh, I have hair that's up to my shoulders. Nicely done, nicely done. On to a next bit where our audience and myself will get to know you a little bit more. What's a fun fact that you have about yourself? I collect sticks and rocks. So I don't collect uh, kichi, tacky um, souvenirs. So what I do is I go to a special place that it's usually a museum or my favorite tourist place at that country or that place. And I collect rocks or sticks and I take them home and I paint them. So my apartment in New York looks like a beaver dam, basically, because there's way too many sticks and too many rocks. Yeah. That sounds like a real vibe. How, what is the criteria for a stick or a rock to be specially chosen? Uh, I think that's its own podcast on its own. <laughs> <laughs> the requirements is the, the rock has to be unique. I like flat rocks and the sticks just has to be, can fit in my suitcase and that customs won't flag it. So as long mm -hmm. as it, um, as it can be put in my suitcase, that's the requirement. Like yeah yeah but i do have had like i go to parks and i will collect about seven eight feet so it's me plus a, like another meter whoa yeah yeah so that's a fun fact about me i like to bring the outdoors in nice nice thanks for sharing all right so now let's dive deeper into the mind of malor are you ready for some rapid fire questions yes i am okay Who's your favorite artist? Richard Serra. We're gonna pull up a picture of Richard Serra right here. Oh my goodness, I've, I think I've heard of him. I think someone did. Like... Richard Serra, the one at Dia Beacon. Mm. Mm, that's my favorite. Would you rather be a poor artist or a rich art collector? Rich art collector. Mm, mm. <laughs> I think I'm going to get a lot of slack for that one. Yes, I'd much rather be a rich art collector so I can support the community mm -hmm. by being a patron. Yes. Facts, facts. If I were a color, I would be? I would be pink with turquoise polka dots. Ooh. And yellow streaks. Everyone's looking up. <laughs> yes, I would be pink. Yes, in that combination. What is the best thing that you've learned this month? This month, the best thing I've learned is about myself and about the community that I've been working with. That me stepping into my power, 
I am able to help the Malaysian creative community, and it has been the best experience in my entire career. That's really great to hear. Nice. What is your favorite art medium? My favorite art medium at the moment is fiber. I love the sewing machine. I love working with fiber, but I also like sewing weird stuff. Like I like sewing plastic or rubbish that I find or even stuff that I'm not supposed to sew and I find that out after. So that's my favorite medium now. Oh, what, what was one of the things that you weren't supposed to sew? Just really hard plastic. Oh. Yeah, um, because I like to work with packaging and found objects. Mm -hmm. And so let's see if it will sew. Well, I found out the hard way you can't. Oh, yeah. oh I see. I see. Um, what is your favorite art movement? Gosh, that's like asking a chef what their favorite food is. Uh, my favorite art movement would be postmodernism, Ooh. Uh, minimalism, and... No, that's it. But I love them all. They're all my children, you see. So but it's kind those of those two are my favorite. Yeah, those two are my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> I have more favorite artists than art movements. Oh, yeah. I yeah. see. Okay, cool, cool. All right. So as we dive into the interview section of the show, let's ask the really general one. You call yourself an artist coach. What yes. does that mean? So me as an artist coach is that I coach artists how to run their business, every aspect of their business, including mindset. And what I do is, is I work with artists from various stages of their career. So I worked with beginner artists or artists that are just out of school to seasoned artists where they have had retrospectives in major museums and I cover various different topics of art business. Interesting. And how'd you get started with it? Uh, I'm actually a trainer. My passion is really teaching people. Mm -hmm. And I thought, why not use my 10 years experience in the art market and combine those two? And it was really by accident. What happened was I was working at an institution where I would come across all sorts of artists, or over a hundred artists. And I noticed they would always have the same challenges. And when they come and meet me, me being the person that I am, I'm always trying to strike up a conversation about their artwork and they would tell me their issues or tell me what they're facing. And so in a way, it ended up being what they like to call a business therapy coaching session. And I thought, hmm, maybe I need to do this as a profession or take it a lot more seriously. So that's how I got into it. And it was really by accident. So it was a, it was a great sandwich of my experience and my passion. And here we are. Yeah, that's such an interesting story because I guess you see a lot of this coaching stuff, especially in like, you know, finance and business, but seldom you see that kind of support system in the creative For industry. For creative, yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. really great. Yeah, and it's, it's something that just evolved. And as I was sharing more of my experiences and coaching people, then through word of mouth, people just said, oh, tell me more. Or, and so that's how I developed them into seminars and coaching sessions. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so now we're going to go into, you know, asking about yourself and your okay. background. So how is your diverse background? Because I understand you moved around a lot yeah. with experiences in different countries. How has that influenced your perspective on art and education? Well, I was very lucky. My father's a diplomat, so we lived overseas. And you, there was no skola manenga, there was no public school, right? So I went to private school my whole life. And the best part about private school, there was always a very strong art and theater department. And we were always taught to always question and think out of the box. And so that really changed, that really not changed, that was just how I was brought up to always question out of the box and that there was never sometimes even a box to begin with. Um, and just being around so many different cultures and people, it was just such a beautiful experience. Like I learned different languages, ate, experienced different foods, and um, it's, it's really instilled a lot in me that... Um, that has really helped me in my career. Like I'm, all, when I'm coaching, I'm always questioning. I'm always asking why. Yeah. So um, 
that's something that has shaped me. It's really interesting because I, I feel like for private schooling, there's a certain idea of like what art is and like a different level of how it's taught compared to public schools. So I think that also translates to what a student or a learner would see in like when they're exposed to that certain type of art forms. Uh, when you were in these different places, how did you get to see these different forms outside of public school access? Well, the best part about living overseas is also being exposed to the culture and how that translates into art and see different people's interpretations of their culture, their different socioeconomic levels and how they're expressing it through their art. So for me, having that exposure to to that translation of artists' lives in very different contexts and countries really helped me uh, appreciate in how I approach different artists as well. All right, so hearing about your many experiences overseas mm -hmm. at different places. So I understand like, um, you know, when you're someplace outside of your home country, that means you're a minority. And does that influence um, how you see art or the kind of art that you produce? Mm, that's a good question. In some ways it does, in some ways it doesn't. I think being, I've always been a minority wherever, uh, in some countries I was always a minority, in some countries it didn't really matter. I think it's more on how I would flip that point of view and say it's just more of I'm more focused on how being a minority, how I can connect with people. So if anything, that was my approach in art or in school or even my everyday interaction with people. It was, yes, this exists, let's celebrate it and let's find common ground. Have you had a situation where you've made something or like someone has expressed that, you know, they, they understood what you were doing with your art from someone that is also a fellow minority, but not from the same group as you are? Yes, and I think it's it's interesting to see different interpretations, and I think that's the whole point of art, to, to have that. Uh, so I was a creative, I was an artist when I was in high school. I was always the theater kid. I was always the art kid that had paint all over my uniform. My principal was like, you got to bleach it. And I think it's just, um, I think it, that's the beauty about art, to see, regardless if you're a minority or not, just to see the different interpretations. Uh, but I think also being overseas as well, that allowed me the license to go crazy because at one point I was drawing a lot of nudes. Yeah, like really skinny nudes. And then at one point it was just all pregnant women and just like really thick bodies. And so it's just interesting to see. And uh, people have shared their interpretation about it. And, mm -hmm. and I've loved it. I've loved it that even to the point where, oh, I never saw it that way. But that's totally, they psychoanalyze my work. Mm -hmm. And that was just really great uh, when people from various backgrounds get to, to, to interpret my work. That's a really interesting point of view. Like, I think I also had a girl in my high school who drew lots of, like, nudes. And it was a girl's school, so it was extra spicy. <laughs> and I'm like, maybe I should have analyzed that more looking back. Hmm. You yeah. never know. <laughs> but while we're talking about, you know, student artists, we're going to... Um, you know, expand a little bit more, mm -hmm. deep dive into, I gotta stop saying deep diving, uh, it's chat GPT okay. doing stuff to okay. us, you know. Yeah. All right, speaking of, you know, student artists, now, um, like, I think we should explore a little bit, because I guess it's different when a student studies art, mm -hmm. and then when they graduate, they know themselves as an artist and not as yeah. a business person. How do they navigate into like art business because you know the creative mind is different compared to like a business profit driven mind yeah um as an artist coach has there been any specific challenges that your clients face when it comes to this kind of situation yes um for those students that come from an academic background so say whether it's a bachelor's degree or postgraduate when I look at their portfolio, they create art within the context of academics. So there's always create this for this, right? And so when I work with them, I would coach them to say, 
take like six months to a year to create art out of the academic realm and gain confidence from there. But it doesn't mean their portfolio sucks or it's bad. It's just take time to be confident in finding your artistic vocabulary, which is your signature style. That's another fancy word, artistic vocabulary, signature style. And then what I see is that there is a gap. You know, art schools make great artists, but maybe not great business people. So what I do is, is that I teach them the theories of art business, like contracts about how to develop a body of work. So there were, are with some clients where I coach them more about developing their style. And then there's somewhere it's just I'm teaching them the theoretical business side of things. Um, there are certain themes that I, I do see with, with uh, especially with students, and it can be as simple as calling themselves an artist. Um, it's kind of like wearing, wearing the big girl or big boy pants. It's like, I'm an artist and putting yourself out there, declaring out there. So I do coach them on that. I'm just beaming, because it sounds like the last thing that you said about like, sometimes the solution can just be as easy as calling someone an artist, and I think, um, yeah, people are very, um, they have a very closed idea of like what artists means, mm -hmm. you know? So even for someone who just does it as a hobby, sometimes they feel like they're not worthy of a certain term. So I think, yeah, that does like a really great boost to like what they believe in themselves and what they think they're capable of. And maybe that will give them like an extra push to go into like business and say, okay, I can do this for my life, you know, this can be what my life is about and not just like a regular job or something that they're not as passionate about, you know. And I think you touched something about it. It's really about mindset. So a lot of my coaching, as much as I can teach you the theory and give you the magic formula, this is the whole thing when I work with artists and that is a common theme. It's like they want this magic pill that I can give them and then poof, they have like 10 exhibitions and they have great sales. If I, if I could really do that and sell that magic pill, like in the matrix, you know, type of thing, I would be rich, okay? Yeah. I would be a supplier of pills, which is an, and not a code. But it's also, but I realize it's really about mindset. It's like, I can give you the steps. I can give you that magic pill. But the mindset towards it is mm -hmm. the thing that I love working with artists with. Um, mm -hmm. But... There are people that separate that, that says mindset, go get a therapist. Um, business coach, come to me. Mm -hmm. For me, I combine it because I just feel that the artist and the person are not two separate things. I can't split that. Mm -hmm. So if there's issues or insecurities about someone calling themselves an artist, I'm like, okay, let's talk about that insecurities. Why do you feel that way? And they'll tell me, I said, okay, what if we equip you with the proper knowledge and the proper business acumen? Would that give you more confidence? Yes. Okay, let's develop your portfolio. So it's, it's a multi, there's multiple layers to it, uh, but that's the fun part, quite honestly. Nice, nice. So when you mentioned about, you know, the psychology of the artist, I think, one of the most obvious ways that that can reflect in an artist's work would definitely be things like pricing, you know? Yes. Like how they undervalue their work and they're like, oh, I don't think that it's worth that yeah. much. Yeah. Um, how do you talk about, talk to them about, you know, pricing strategy, about like how this is how you have to be confident, you have to believe in yourself as an artist and this shows in other aspects of what you do? So... If I were to tackle, say, pricing with an artist, one, I would, the first thing I would do is work with them to make sure that they, they have that confidence to call themselves an artist, because some are very shy about it. And another way I build that confidence is help them to understand these are the different ways you can price your artwork. So this is very theoretical. And then from there, we I teach them how to state your price when you want to sell. So I do, one thing about my coaching is that I really like to do is the real life tips. It's not just theoretical. It's like, no, tell me, act it out. So one of the tips I tell 
uh, artist is when you're stating a price, state it as if you're going to a mama, you're going to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Your price is neutral. So when you go to a restaurant, you just order, I want pizza, I want one roti chanai, I want, you know, that's what you do, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's neutral. There's nothing towards it. So, um, it's not like you're going to a restaurant and ask, hey, I want a pizza, but could you not do that because I'm allergic? And then this, but you know, sometimes I like, like sometimes I like pesto, but not really. And it reminds me, it's like, there's a story to it. There's so much emotion. No, mm -hmm. price is neutral. Just like when you order, it's neutral. Mm -hmm. So I teach them tips like that. So when you tell someone a price, this is like free coaching right here. <laughs> free tips, not free, but it's just mm -hmm. it's just something I always love to share. Um, when you're when say for example when you're stating your price, state your price and shut up. <laughs> Blunt, but yes, understandable. Yes. Yeah. So it's because it's just like when you order a pizza, you say uh, one Hawaiian pizza, and then what? It's just like boss satu roti chanai. Just shut up. You're not gonna. Or you're not gonna ramble on with the waiter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So treat your price that way. So, so that's one way where I work with artists. One, it's the mindset. Mm -hmm. Two, it's the theoretical. And three, I give them the tips and mm -hmm. tricks. Um, and this I share with anyone. It's not like you have to pay for it. The one thing is, is that I always share whatever coaching freely like that. So, um, yeah, that's just an example of. Mm -hmm how mindset and pricing, there are many different other topics in, in the art business. It mm -hmm. could be pricing, it could be gallery representation or what. It always comes together, mindset and that topic. So I always work with both. That's that's really good. Like I like that when you mentioned it was about like neutrality in that yeah. statement. But I don't know, something that I've also faced, I guess, is like the like for me as an artist stating that this is it, like in a neutral tone, but then there's also like a response back. Yeah. And then like, especially for, you know, people who, artists who, I guess, just newly found confidence and it's not that like strong of a foundation yet. And they don't quite have the, you know, the belief in themselves that like, yeah, I'm worth this much. But then they're like, I'm worth this much, you know? <laughs> like there's that energy difference. So they don't really have the balls yet to be that firm in like, I guess in, for example, pricing, cause that's what we're talking about now. Yeah. Like, is there any specific tips for situations like that? I would say always reframe the situation. So it's, if you're stating your price, just state your price as if you're ordering pizza and just say it and keep quiet because that silence is data because when you let the client speak after that, they will tell you their consideration, whether it's a pricing consideration, a framing consideration, uh, say the material is an odd material, they think about cleaning, then you can apply your other, then you know how to counter that to get that sale. Yeah. Oh, that's a really good answer. Yeah. So for me, it's, um, in my coaching, that's part of my, a coach is someone that holds a mirror to you and provides a different perspective. I will never tell you, you should do this, this, this. It's like, what are your goals? But I will provide a different perspective. So in that case, I would provide the coaching. I see your point of view. Let's mm -hmm. shift it so that it's, you feel powerful about it so that you feel power in that silence, Dang. that awkwardness. Yeah. I can see how the life coaching plays into this now because I'm like, so many arguments and I'm like panicking in the silence. I'm like, oh no, what if they think yeah. this? But I'm like, yeah, that's the situation. Wow. Yeah, so we're having a coaching session right here, I think. Man, as well. The life coaching is coming in. All right, now we will be talking about the business knowledge side of stuff. Mm, so if favorite. any business bros have been paying attention, this is your favorite <laughs> part. All right, oh, now we're getting to the real stuff. All right. Um, so in your experience, um, especially in art business, how different is it from regular business? And is there any like fundamental business knowledge that is important for new artists to learn and how important is this knowledge can it like change their career things like you know gallery 
standards and contracts, things like that? So yes, uh, there's a lot of overlap between art business and any other business, from contracts to budgeting to um, business proposals and all that. So th there are business and then there's soft skills overlap, right? Um, but the one thing that I that is very unique but not really because retail does this, is um, the first thing that I noticed that I always talk to my artists about, regardless of which stage in their careers is, is pricing artworks, making sure that it's competitive, making sure that it covers costs, making sure that it covers overheads. And um, so that's one thing. Contracts is another thing, especially in Malaysia, the amount of horror stories that I've heard um, so like the terms and conditions, that's all legal. That's all, um, very much in the business world. Then there's also the other aspects like writing a proposal for a residency program. Then there's the non-business part, but it's kind of the skills to business like networking, mm -hmm. negotiation. So there's a lot of overlap and then there's a lot of unique things. Another thing that is quite unique, but in retail, they have it is inventory numbers, taking inventory, looking at the sales chart. So there's a lot of skills that overlaps, um, but it's not unique, necessarily unique to the art world. And some things are. I see. I see. Yeah. Like, um, like knowing this is more in the gallery world, like knowing the provenance of an artwork, meaning knowing who has had ownership about from it. Yeah. And then there's also the technical stuff like conservation and all that. So there are many facets of the, uh, when I work with artists, there are many facets that they need to know. There are many aspects towards their business, but I make sure when I work with the artists, especially in my one-on-one -on -one coaching is that what, they need to know, they need to know just that part. I don't overwhelm them with everything. It's like, I can't make them eat a whole, like huge pizza. I just feed them a slice. And then the next time I meet them, I say, okay, we're gonna learn this next and we're gonna learn that next. So um, it's just about learning in stages because it can be overwhelming. So take what you can take in that's relevant to you at that time. That's how I work with my clients. And then we will progress later with all the other skills. I think it's interesting that you mentioned stages because I, I guess that's also kind of related to what their expectations are, what are their goals they want to hit. And when you have that conversation, do you have like some sort of like multiple choice kind of arrangement where they're like, what are your goals? Is it tier A, tier B, tier C? And like, because I get different standards also, like mm -hmm. if someone wants to be a fine artist where they do galleries, that's like yeah. a certain expectation of work with like different business systems compared to someone who makes prints or yeah. like ceramics or, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Is, is there a way how you operate and separate that kind of information for people that you coach? Yes, and that's my favorite part, actually. So before every coaching session that I have, uh, this is private clients, not my seminars. Yeah. So before every coaching session is that they must do homework and I do not meet them until they do their homework because there's no point. I don't believe in wasting their money or taking their money because what it is, is I have a lot of questions. So me as an artist coach, my role is to make the artist win by really achieving their goals. And it can be any goal, right? But it has to be true to them. So I can get them clear. Like, is this really what you want? What is it you really want? You want to make money? Okay, well, you can make money any other place. You don't have to go to a gallery. You can sell on your own. So I get clear on that goal that it's not a goal that everyone uses. It's not a safe goal, but it's really catered to them. Then from there, what I do is... Um, 
From there, I analyze their data before the first session. I analyze their sales data. If they have no sales, I analyze data of, say, um, their inquiries. Is it coming from Instagram? Is it coming from their website? And see what artworks do they get a lot of inquiries about. Or I analyze their portfolio of their students. From there, I understand what their goals are, OK? So I understand where they want to go and where they're working with. Because a lot of artists that I talk to, even the seasoned artists, they don't collect their data. So I say, OK. So from there, I have the data. I know where they want to go. I'll coach them. And I ask a lot of questions. And sometimes people don't get why. But I will. sometimes I'll go for an hour asking them questions. And it's not, it's not stupid questions. It's not like, oh, how much was this sale? How much was that sale? It, because I already have that data. But I really try and understand their process, what their motivations are. And then if it's aligned to their goals, then I say, OK, if this is your ultimate goal, this I will not ever change it. I will not ever influence you about it. But as a coach, I will say, OK, how are we going to get there? These are the different steps. OK, to have this step, to, to get to this step, OK, how does your social media, networking, um, practice all support that? So that's my role as a coach, and that's my process. And yes, it can be like kind of like it starts one pathway, but it spreads out. It's like, OK, let's do prints, and then let's do fine art. Let's do merchandise, or let's do that. But sometimes when an artist has way too many pathways, I'm like, OK, let's focus on one or two. But sometimes I will say if they only have one pathway, but there's other ways to sell their art, I will propose that to them. But I, I'm never the driver. I'm never the driver of, I'm never the, the captain of the ship. It's always them. So if they don't do the homework, or they don't network, or they don't do what, say, is suggested that that is proven um, successful, then that's really up to them. See. So it's it's a lot of hard work in that sense. I facilitate, but they're the drive. They're the driver. They're the captain, and they're their own motivator. Yeah. You mentioned you know data driven approaches. Mm -hmm. How would an artist? Because from your explanation, you said that you you asked them a lot of questions. Yeah. So how would an artist, for example, if they don't have access to this sort of coaching, like what would what would be the things that they have to pay attention to? Because there's also like different types of data, and yes. right now the main thing that is like the textbook answer would be you know social media engagement. But besides that, you also mentioned you know networking yeah. stuff like that. The people you have contacts with. What is the range of data, and like how can someone get started into that? So that's a great question, and. There are four major datas that I always tell artists to collect. And if they don't, they really have no choice. <laughs> because I find it that it's just, there's, there's no negotiation with it. One is inventory. They must always have an inventory of all their artworks. Second is the sales data of who bought it, how much was it bought, how quickly it was bought, and and client details, like the location of the client. The third is their network data. So when you meet people, you always need to, I always collect information about it. Um, for example, where I met them, what industry they're in. And these networks are your clients also, so possible potential clients. The other data I have is pricing, pricing breakdown. For example, if, if this is an artwork, OK. Um, how much was the materials? How much was your overheads? How much, yeah, and then how much time did you spend on it? So those are the four important data things. And Data is basically essentially the whole point of any business to collect. If you know something sells based on the data, sell some more. If you know that the demand is higher than the production, that means you can rise, raise your prices. So when I work with clients, I have a huge warning to them in the sense that when you work with me, I can certainly support you, but there's homework on your end. There has to be accountability on your end. So have this data. It It is mind boggling how many artists don't have this data, even the seasoned ones. And I'm like, wow, like you must have been really lucky or something, but it 
it is it is the backbone of any anything. Um, so if you want to know what is successful or what isn't, it's all based on data. So the same applies to artists. Uh, data is the backbone of their business, and I I guide them as to how to take inventory and what to do. And then from there, that's when we can get into the nitty gritty fun stuff. So in the very beginning, the, when I work with artists, it's collect the data. All right, thanks Mulor. One final question, and I think this is a pretty loaded question. I it's love about... loaded <laughs> questions, by the way. I love it when they're multi-layered and loaded, yeah. I think it's also like a bit of a soft spot for me because it talks about like, you know, global perspective and mm -hmm. how um, your work impacts local artists. Mm -hmm. um, so given your experience, your routine of working in New York um, and then you come back for a couple of months, come back to Malaysia and you host events that empower local artists, seeing that you interact with artists from different places, different continents, maybe even, you know, like different beliefs and mentalities is there um differences that you see does it mean there's a difference in the way that you coach them there are cultural differences that i do take into account um but i find all artists regardless of where they're from face the same thing face the same insecurity face the same control issues face the same um uh, perfectionism issues and everything. Uh, yes, there is a difference in the way I do coach them if it's a cultural thing. Um, having lived in seven, eight different countries, I've lost count and gone to 13 different schools, uh, it kind of gives you a really great, you have high EQ really, so you can, I can read the room. So I know when I, when I talk to certain people, um, I can go all out, right? But when I talk to other people, I have to tread carefully. Um, so, but in terms of what artists is facing, it's pretty much the same everywhere. If anything, being in New York is even more competitive because the market, there's so many artists there. New York City is the center of the art world in the United States. You know, In Europe, it's um, in London, and then in Asia, it's Hong Kong, right? So. If anything, it's my approach would just shift to um, different strategies based on that market. But the thing I love about being based in New York is after a decade of experience, I take that knowledge and then bring it back to Malaysia so that the Malaysian artists can learn from all this, but from an international standard. So when I coach, I always say to them, I said, I never will coach you for playing small. I will coach you for playing big. So I will coach you and give you the resources and the knowledge based on international standards because that's what I believe in that you can do. Um, and so far, everything's been been really great. Uh, people understand and they, they appreciate that, that I always see them play in the bigger game. Um, but in turn, I find that all artists go through the same thing. It's just more cutthroat in New York City mm -hmm. and, and in the States because there's just so saturated. There's like so many artists within Brooklyn, Manhattan, uh, Brooklyn alone, you know, there's almost a lot of artists live there. So um, yes, so yes, my approach is different, but the same topics, the same context, it's, it's, it will change according to the different markets, but it's, it just all depends. You know, there's more galleries in New York, so the approach is different, but it's still approaching a gallery, just like in Malaysia, for example. Right, right. Um, I think another interesting thing that you brought up is like how when you talk to local artists, you're teaching them, you know, to play the big game, you know, yes. for, with like global standards. What are some of the examples of like that that you know key information that you have shared with us local malaysian artists well that's a very good question um one is how they present themselves to clients and present themselves in terms of their portfolio the the sales pdfs that they have what international clients expect um logistics how to keep logistics in mind um another thing is 
uh, how to approach closing a sale. Um, and it's, it's a combination of those. Uh, and the very global opportunities that um, there's out that is out there. So when I coach them, I give them that example. I give them the ultimate example, and I also make sure that different local is like this. But when you go overseas, don't do that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's usually those. It's usually during about sales, about presenting yourself overseas. Um, really upping your game. I see. Cool, cool. I think one thing just now you mentioned um, how how you close sales. Is closing sales different like by from an international standard compared to locally? Because now in my head, I'm like, do local artists like meet a buyer or meet a client and then they go to a mama shop and they'll be like, shake hands and then they're like, yay, Roti uh, China. Is it different overseas? Or am I even picturing the right picture for local? <laughs> it, it's, um, there is a difference because there are different players overseas. For, for example, there is, uh, the artist wouldn't close, but maybe the, uh, the art advisor would close. So yes and no. Yes, in the sense where I find overseas, it can be a lot more brutal. A lot more so sometimes you only have that one opportunity to present yourself like if you send that sales PDF late no you took two weeks no you know um, so I think um, overseas it's not it's more cutthroat and less apologetic uh, so yes there is a difference uh, but you have to see where you are in New York City it's just it's, it's a hustle, it's cutthroat. There's so many galleries. In one street, there's, it can be about 10, 20 galleries in one street. So you see the competition. So if one client is already buying from one gallery and another gallery, what makes you think they're gonna buy from a third? You know, so um, it's not different, but I think it's more cutthroat. So that means the approach has to be different and how you're prepared for it, you know. Um, for example, in KL, I notice um, some galleries will only present the price list after the opening. But in New York, they present it a month to three weeks before that during opening night, it's not surprising that half of the artworks are sold or maybe 80% are sold or that when they go to art fairs, it's sold out at the booth. So when, mm -hmm. when people come, it's sold out. So in that sense, how they approach sales and marketing, I will tell the KL clients as in my a, um, Malaysian artists that there is that difference. So then what I do is I work with them, for example, that means you have to get your artwork images way before. And the pace in Malaysia is like, where are you? Oh, I'm almost there, but you're in bed, you know? So, so I have to also, it's a mindset mm -hmm. habit thing. Yeah. Like, okay, Culturally here, we're not like that, but I'm instilling in you that. So I'm not trying to be a hard ass. I'm just telling you, if you want to get that exhibition overseas, you need to have your photography done two months before any event. And then you have to ship it maybe three months before the event. That means you have to let it dry four months. You know? So there's all these factors. So that's also how I work with clients. Um, the same just cutthroat. So that means people's attitudes, people's approach and production is different. So that definitely I teach um, my Malaysian artists, clients, or anyone that will listen like, hey, this is how it is. Um, and if you can keep up, great. If not, then stick to the local market. So I don't dismiss them if they're mm -hmm. saying, oh, that's just out of my, uh, that's just not, um, something they can handle is in production wise. Okay, great. Let's work with what you can handle. Yeah. So that's just an example that, yes, sales is the same, but it's just more cutthroat. The way they do it is just different. 
That was very eye-opening. I got a little bit scared hearing all of that. <laughs> um, but that being said, do you have any advice, like, after all that we've talked about? Do you have mm. anything that that would be fundamental for local artists to know? The one thing is, is always stay true to your vision, to your gut. Uh, I'm encountering artists that, and this is not just in Malaysia, just in general, um, is always stay true to your vision. And I call it creative intuition, where you tap into this flow of, it's when you're in the studio and you lose track of time and you're just so excited and you're just focused on the now. So always tap into that. Um, the other thing is, is I tell artists to also always live your truth. If, if you're in a state of confusion and that's your truth, then live it. And if the next day your truth changes, then live it, then so be it. But always stick to your truth because a lot of artists get confused or feel pressured about the noise. I call it the really just noise, which is the pressure the art market, the gallery, if they will like it, this is all noise. So when you can tap into that and live your truth, this quietens. And from there, you're going to explore and create art and to always, to just keep going. And if ever one day it happens, life is up and down. So when you reach a point where you're confused and you're asking yourself, you know, I just, I'm not making sales or this is very frustrating or my exhibition didn't sell or what, then I would say go back to basics and go back to tapping into that flow and live your truth. And whatever your truth is, so be it. Whether it you have or don't have an answer, live in that question then, and that's your truth. Um, so those are the two big things that I, my parting words with artists, um, is to always tap into your flow and live your truth. Flow and truth, two key words. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Mulo, for this really enlightening interview. It's like, I just learned so much today. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed myself, and thank you to the whole team as well. Wait, guys, don't go. Uh, we have more fun games coming up after the break. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to the game segment of Late Night Connections. Today we have a very special game just because Malor is an artist, I feel like an artist. No, after that whole talk, I am an artist. <laughs> yes, and I am an artist coach. <laughs> and say that in a neutral way, like you're ordering pizza. I'm an artist, and Malor is an artist coach. And today we will be playing quick draw where we draw things i mean our answers to the questions in 30 seconds and we'll see what comes out oh, all right this is fun i can't wait okay are you ready for the first question yes draw your favorite place in three two one <laughs> oh no wait <laughs> Oh my god, it's so hard now. It always looks so fun from behind the scenes. Oh. This looks so bad. I'm gonna start over. No! Okay, shall we reveal? Yeah. Um draft one <laughs> version two. So can you see? So what did you draw? Um, what I drew is Smalen from Ikea back in the time that they had it. A what? <laughs> you know, like when you go to Ikea, they have like the children's section where parents take a big a break oh, from yeah, being parents. Yeah. That's and then your happy place? Yeah, I used to go there a lot. And then this is the ball pit. And this is the thing that I now realize was a sunken ship. I just like climbing up and I didn't realize it was a boat that wasn't oh. straight. And these are little children. Yeah. And oh. that's the bug sticker that they give you when you go in there. That's really great. <laughs> oh, I feel a bit 
so mine, it was supposed to be a house, and that was supposed to be a gate, but it looked like a jail or something. So, so I put house heart. So that's my favorite place because sometimes my home always changed. Mm. So it was kind of where my heart was or where I felt comfortable. It's, it's a very conceptual piece. Mm -hmm. Abstracted a bit, but yeah. <laughs> I, see. I see it. Yeah. All right, I'll be okay, ready for the Okay, what's the next the one? I one. like this game. <laughs> the stress makes it so much more intense. I know. I All know. Right. What's the next one? The second one is your favorite painting. And I'm just going to give five painting seconds. Painting or artwork? I think, I think we can go artwork. Yeah. We can, we can be flexible. We can go artwork, but... I think we can give like, you know, five seconds of thinking time, but that's mainly for me because I need it. I didn't think of the questions through when I came up with them, so I'm gonna need some time to think. Mm. Okay. Tell me when I can start. Can okay, start? we'll start in three, two, one, go. Whoa. <laughs> this is this is my conceptual Wait. piece. Do you recognize it? Is it Picasso's guitar, the Cubist, or no? Oh no 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 no! This is by a local artist. Oh. Yeah. Um. What? So, um, maybe I did, maybe it was too ambitious of an artwork to draw in thirty seconds, but it's actually the Tetaric Man that Red Hole oh, needed. Oh my god. <laughs> I told I thought it was kind of cubist, so it, I thought this was a guitar. So part of Picasso with the guitar and and George Braque. Okay. Wow! Like I was trying to do the grid thingy, Actually, but then it I was too it. small. Do you guys see it? I see it totally. Yeah, but well, yeah. I think the team can the team can dissect. We can put up a real image right here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what came. Out. What about oh, yours? Mine is uh, Richard Serra, but I said that already. So Richard Serra works with steel, and he um, you can actually enter it. So mm. he works with this huge, he works with this huge uh, steel sheets, and it's curved, and it looks like it's gonna fall, but it's not. So uh, you can enter from there, and he also does these cubes. Um, which is at the MoMA. He has these Richard Serra, and it's like two, four, six, eight, eight. So, um, well, that's easy to draw. So, yeah. I found so it so not, not much. Yeah, it's just basic lines. So, that's my favorite artwork. Nice. You know, the first time I heard of Richard Serra was from like architecture school. I'm not surprised and I'm really happy. So he's part, he's minimalist. He's, mm. he's very minimalist. But um, the reason why I like him is actually, um, actually most of the minimalist artists is that imagine going into such high steel, steel curved walls and you enter. It's actually for me a very religious and spiritual experience because these steel plates that are that thick can fall on me at any time but they they're not so there's an element of faith and science and i feel like such a small person mm -hmm. in this in this big brown copper looking thing and then and so in a way it makes me realize that i am just a small being in this big universe um, and so it's very humbling. It's also extremely spiritual and there's no one there but myself. And the steel is very cold and mm -hmm. just uh, very isolating. So um, 
that is just some insight into my love and analysis and my interpretation of Richard Serra. So I'm glad. Uh, I love that one. Thank you. I Thank love, you for allowing me to it. share. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what's the next one? All right. So the last one is... Are you ready for it? It's a bit narcissistic. It's um, draw yourself. Are we ready? <laughs> I see your paint cap we, is already on. We have how many seconds? 30 seconds? 30 seconds, yeah. Wait, let me make sure this color works. Okay, draw myself. Yeah. Ready? Okay, yes. Okay, in three, two, one, go. Ooh. Wow. Cubism, some might say, <laughs> on the corners and angles. No, I think there were some reactions in the team. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, so that's... I tried drawing my curtain bangs, but they don't look like that in real life right now. I haven't washed my hair in like a week, so it's not reflecting. Um, and then I tried to keep the face, you know, realistic because... I feel like that's the face that I've made a lot in this recording. It's, you know. I like mm. it. And the Tweety Bird lips, you know. Mm. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if I want to show mine. Here, let's compare between oh. <laughs> <laughs> mine. So, um, uh, a lot of my work of coaching is, it's, you know, I'm talking, so it comes through my face. And so, um, I'm very vain about my hair, and it's always doing this very big flippy thing. Uh -huh. uh, but um, the star, that's actually stars Ooh. in the eyes. Usually I draw eyes big. And then that nose is because actually I have a birthmark on my nose. Um, I remember one photographer thought it was bad shading or contouring, and I was just like, no, that's a birthmark on my nose. So that's the dot. And the stars is actually the twinkle in my eye and how I see artists when I coach them because I love that sense of wonder and empowerment and when they feel, yes, I can do this. And it also makes me say, yes, I'm an artist coach. And so that's supposed to be stars and not, she looks kind of weird to the eyes. Like, like she's on drugs or something, but that's it's a vibe. A it's yeah, a vibe. Yeah, and I love that. It's also having like the Marilyn Monroe moment, like it's flowy in the wind, like the flow and living your truth. Yeah. There you go, people. <laughs> this is why um, what I love about art. There are many different interpretations, and yeah, I'm glad I could um, uh, play that game. I actually like that. I kind of want another one now, but. Uh, <laughs> The show must end, I guess. It does. All right, that's all for tonight. Thank you so much, Malor, for taking the time to have this wonderful conversation with us. Uh, it's been such a pleasure, and I totally enjoyed myself. Thank you so much, Sol, and to the rest of the team. Uh, I love being here and playing games and sharing about being an artist coach. Love to hear that. Always a great thing to hear from our guests. Great to know that Late Night Connections is doing what it's meant to do. <laughs> connecting people. <laughs> All right. To say thank you and also being on the second season, we have more budget now. We got merch, guys. Woo! Yay! Woo! Wow. <laughs> so this is awesome. This Late is, Night uh, Connections yeah. mug with... Uh, in-house made keychain there you go with late night connections on it and then if you're name dropping our podcast we have the qr code at the back you can scan Ooh, how'd you guys make this uh point let me pull off the protag 
um, that one of those burner machine thingies. Yeah, we do have a laser cutting machine. Laser this cutting actually. machine. Yes. Yay. Yeah, yeah. I'm an artist coach. I don't know all terminologies, but this is great. And we also okay. have a phone stand, also wow. made in house in our woodworking lab. Carpentry. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Um, totally. I love it. Yours, yeah. yours. We'll link Malor's socials in the caption below so if you guys have questions you guys want to reach out don't forget to comment below and stay tuned for the next episode of late night connections i'm your guest host sol good night until we reconnect again bye